It's been quite a while since I last made a video talking about Five Nights at Freddy's, hasn't it? Feels like earlier on my channel it was the only thing I was able to really talk about, but nowadays it becomes rarer and rarer that I even bother to do so on here. And this isn't really because I find myself liking the series less, it's more so because I feel like for the most part I've expressed almost all the opinions I really wanted to about this series. Anything else I really have to say I feel has been said already by several other content creators at this point, so oftentimes I don't really see too much reason to bother. That being said though, with all the recent news about Ruin and Help Wanted 2 and the upcoming FNAF movie, I found myself in a bit of a FNAF kick all over again. This led me to revisiting a lot of the older titles I enjoy on my free time, playing through FNAFs 3 and 4 again, watching some newer FNAF content, and what ended up leading to the subject of today's video, replaying Curse of Dreadbear on FNAF Help Wanted. I feel like it goes without saying that Curse of Dreadbear may be my favorite FNAF content we have to date, or at least it's high up there. A DLC entirely dedicated to giving us some new FNAF gameplay that is entirely themed around the Halloween season seems like a dream come true for me, and in many ways it really is. Revisiting this DLC was a wonderful time. Many of the minigames within it were extremely enjoyable with unique atmospheres and gameplay that set them apart from what we're used to with the rest of the series. But there is one game mode in particular which really catches my eye. One which I originally revisited purely for the spectacle of it, but ended up catching me by surprise with what I may now consider to be the best gameplay loop the series has to offer. And that game mode is Danger Keep Out. On the surface, this set of minigames may just look like a spooky Halloween version of the FNAF 1 gameplay, which is honestly what I expected when I revisited it years later. However, upon inspecting it closer and really analyzing what this set of minigames does, you'll see that it's actually one of the most competently crafted and enjoyable sets of nights you can play from any official FNAF title. And that's what I plan on doing in today's video. In this video, I plan on digging deep into the gameplay of Danger Keep Out, discussing what makes it work and explaining why I personally feel that it is the best made set of nights in the entire official FNAF series. So without further ado, let's delve into it. So I feel like before I can explain what makes this particular game mode work so effectively, I must first explain what makes good FNAF gameplay in the first place. FNAF on the surface is a very simple game, but it's that simplicity which makes it so enjoyable and allows for many different interesting elements to be thrown into it. FNAF's gameplay revolves around the idea of being confined to a single location, fending for yourself as multiple unique threats slowly make their way towards you. Usually there is also some kind of resource management thrown into the mix, making it so that any competently made FNAF game feels like a stressful juggling act. You constantly find yourself worrying about something while dealing with whatever you're faced with, making you feel like you're always on the move even when trapped in a single spot. And I feel like what often makes or breaks these kind of gameplay loops is when the mechanics presented are properly explored and the threats are actually unique. Take for example, FNAF 1. This game in many regards succeeds at providing the gameplay I previously described, but it has some glaring issues which stop it from being perfect. FNAF 1's gameplay revolves entirely around blocking out four unique threats from your office with a resource which permanently depletes every single time you use it. FNAF 1's power makes it so that everything you do counts. The use of the cameras, the closing of the doors, the use of your light, all of it is directly tied to your power which means you have to use it sparingly. This gameplay is meant to perfectly coincide with what it wants the player to do, that being to use your power to track down where the animatronics are on the cameras to ensure they aren't close by so you don't waste more power leaving the doors closed. And you see, for the most part, this works well. The animatronics all behave uniquely, making it so that you do need to keep track of what they're doing most of the time. Freddy is an ever-present threat past night 3, and Foxy makes it so the cameras do need to be used very frequently. But there is a massive glaring issue with the gameplay design of FNAF 1, that being that the majority of the cameras are pretty much useless to the player. 
See, when playing through FNAF 1, with the exceptions of Foxy and maybe Freddy depending on your strategy, the cameras don't aid you in fending off the animatronics in any way. The door lights exist to warn you of Bonnie and Chica's presence and there is no consequence to them arriving there. What this effectively means is that the best way to play FNAF 1 is to basically ignore what the game wants you to do and simply check both lights over and over as well as Foxy every now and then. The cameras are meant to be a fundamental part of the gameplay and yet with the way FNAF 1 is designed they aren't nearly as useful as they're meant to be. Combine this with the length of the nights and FNAF 1 can quickly become very tedious compared to some of its sequels. It's still a good game, don't get me wrong, but I bring this up to demonstrate that even one of the best games in the series for gameplay still has glaring issues with how it's designed. And now that you have an idea of what makes a good FNAF gameplay loop and the flaws that can drag one down, let's take a look at Danger Keep Out and see how it works to improve upon those issues. Like I said at the beginning, Danger Keep Out upon first glance seems extremely similar to that of FNAF 1. The layout of the building is the same, the office is laid out identically, and the roster of animatronics are Halloween versions of our original cast. But upon actually playing it and looking around at our surroundings, the differences become very apparent. The first thing you may notice is the lack of doors, with there now being wooden planks that take their place. This is because Danger Keep Out opted for a new means of defense, that being the flash beacon which is given to us at either door and on the cameras. Rather than shutting out all the threats that come for us, we instead have to look for them on the cameras, flashing them with the beacon and sending them back to where they came from. If you fail to find them in time, they come to your door and begin to destroy the planks. Each hit the Jacko animatronics do causes permanent damage, making it so that with each time they arrive, they are one step closer to killing you. This mechanic is a wonderful alternative to the doors which fixes my most glaring issues with FNAF 1 and pretty well every other FNAF game where the cameras are used. In this set of nights, the cameras aren't just there for show and they aren't only useful for one threat. Instead, they are integral to your survival. Tracking down and finding the animatronics is your top priority because there is a legitimate consequence to them arriving at your office. Sure, you can use the beacon when they arrive there, but each time you do, you are seriously risking them doing permanent damage which can come back to haunt you later. And on top of that, you also need to be sure they aren't close to your office because much like FNAF 1's doors, the beacons use power. Sure, you don't lose it permanently, but every use of the beacon drains your power immensely, with the only way to get it back being to shut it down and wait for it to slowly recharge while you sit in the dark. This effectively makes it so that players who choose not to actively look for the animatronics are punished for when the power goes out, often forcing them into the horrifying situation of watching one of the animatronics come to your door while you are completely powerless to stop them. This mechanic alone both plays wonderfully into what I already love about the FNAF gameplay loop to begin with, as well as fixing its biggest flaws. It forces us to pay attention to our resources, keeping track of our power and figuring out the best time to recharge it, and on top of that the inclusion of the wooden planks makes it so that the stress and tension of the night increases each time we allow an animatronic to slip past our sights. And of course, it makes the cameras a top priority with tracking animatronics being integral to our survival, fixing an issue which has bothered me since the earliest entries in the series. And speaking of tracking the animatronics, this game mode also plays wonderfully into the other major element that I feel makes a well-designed FNAF game, that of course being the animatronics themselves. Much like the layout and map of this game mode, the animatronics in Danger Keep Out at first glance seem very reminiscent of their FNAF 1 counterparts. However, the new gameplay brought about by the beacon mechanic allows for the animatronics to behave very differently from what you'd expect. The first of these animatronics I'd like to bring up, and the two you encounter before any others, are the Jacko animatronics, Jacko Bonnie and Chica. These two are the main threats you need to keep track of as they make their way towards your office. And what I love about these guys, other than their orange pumpkin aesthetic, is how they actually take advantage of the fact that you need to find them in order to win. These guys like to hide, and they do so very effectively. You see, the map of this game mode is covered from head to toe in jack-o'-lanterns, which at first just seems like a cute little thing that was done to make the location fit better with the overall theme. 
However, once the animatronics start moving, it becomes very apparent that this was a conscious decision done to make tracking Bonnie and Chica very difficult. Since these two are constantly glowing like the pumpkins around them, it is very easy to either miss them when they are there, or in an even worse scenario, flash your beacon thinking they're in a room that they aren't. There are even instances during the night where we see Jacko Chica in particular take advantage of this, oftentimes using her pumpkin prop to further blend in with the environment. Take for example when she's standing in the corner of the right hall. As you can see here, she actually holds her pumpkin prop right up against the camera, making it very easy for you to assume she isn't there at all and making yourself vulnerable for when she closes in to break down your door. The game forcing you to actively look for these guys allowed Steel Wool to add a lot of nuance and personality to how they behaved on the cameras, making the search for them all the more stressful and allowing the player to build up a sort of relationship with how these characters function. The next of the animatronics in this game mode is Grim Foxy, and he changes things up a lot with his inclusion. Grim Foxy follows the traditional Foxy mechanic, slowly peeking out from his curtains before attempting to make a mad dash towards your office. The major difference here is that rather than him being stalled by the cameras themselves, the player must flash him with the beacon to send him back to his starting position. If you fail to do so, he sprints to your office and you are killed instantly. Having Grim Foxy active adds a whole new layer to the stress of this game mode. He's essentially a ticking time bomb that the player has to constantly have on the back of their mind while hunting for the other animatronics. And on top of that, since you have to actively take time to swap over to his camera and flash him, it creates these tense scenarios where the Jackos are able to move while your attention is elsewhere. There are also times where you may run out of power before you're able to flash your beacon at him, creating these terrifying situations for yourself where you sit in the dark fearing that he may come sprinting down the hall to end your run in an instant. The final and easily scariest of this Halloween roster of characters is Dreadbear, who only becomes active on the final night. Dreadbear is very unique compared to the other characters we talked about, posing a much bigger threat over the course of the night. You see, once Dreadbear becomes active, he begins moving in a straight line towards your office from the right side of the building. He doesn't emit any light except for his eyes when he's actively moving, and the only easy way to track him is by listening for his massive footsteps. Dreadbear isn't stopped by the beacon in the same way the other characters are. Rather than being sent back to a previous camera, it simply stuns him for a moment. This means that any and all progress he makes towards the office is permanent and you need to keep tabs on him at all times. If you fail to do so, he breaks down the doors to your office instantly and it's game over. This mechanic is so scary to actively deal with in-game. On top of the other three threats that are constantly on the move, you now have this ever-present enemy who is slowly but surely making his way towards you, warning you of his presence with the sound of his massive footsteps. I kid you not when I say that every single time I heard Dreadbear on the move, it put me into a state of panic, constantly swapping between different cameras to try my hardest and stall his movement. And, of course, with three other threats that demand my attention on the move, you can probably imagine what happened as a result of me getting so distracted. Dreadbear being thrown into the mix makes Night 3 of this game mode insanely challenging. Having four unique threats constantly active while having barely enough power to slow them all down turns this game mode into the stressful juggling act I was talking about earlier. You have to keep tabs on everything, and even the slightest slip up has serious consequences. Just take a look at my winning attempt, for example. Near the end here, at 5am, I was starting to panic because I could hear Dreadbear right outside my office. This panic led to me making a very stupid mistake as I shut down the power rather than flashing Foxy, allowing him to make progress towards potentially killing me. And on top of all that, while I sat in the dark waiting for the power to come back, who arrived but Jack O'Bonnie himself, who I neglected as a result of my blind panic. The only reason I managed to survive this was because my power just barely came back in time, allowing me to send him away and stop Foxy right before his sprint. 
all of this happened on my winning attempt. This was the one where I actually pulled through. Imagine what all my other attempts at this night looked like with that in mind. It's so insanely stressful. But of course, that's what makes it so fun in the end. Because I can tell you right now that finally seeing that 6am screen was the most relieving thing in the world. Danger Keep Out is the perfect culmination of everything that makes the FNAF gameplay loop enjoyable to play. It puts you in a dangerous situation with four completely unique threats who are all actively working their way towards you while you try to fend them off with what little resources you have. It actually incentivizes the use of the cameras, a mechanic which is often poorly done in other games in my opinion, and does so while also making the active threats take advantage of that. I was so happily surprised when I played this game mode. I went in expecting a goofy little Halloween reskin of the FNAF gameplay I love, and ended up finding something even better that I feel more people need to talk about. I'm hoping from future installments like Help Wanted 2 that we can see more ideas like this get explored. It's always cool to see how this simple gameplay loop can be twisted on its head to create something new and stressful, and I feel like Danger Keep Out is the perfect example of how that can be done effectively. Anyways though, that'll be all from me. I hope you all enjoyed this video as much as I enjoyed making it. Revisiting FNAF on here has honestly been really fun to do, and I greatly look forward to seeing what new installments of the series will be able to do in the future. I hope to see you here in whatever my next project ends up being. Goodbye for now.